All right, Pedro. So you and I have been talking for a little bit and we've known each other for a while. And, you know, I've looked up to a lot of the work that you've been doing um, as a CEO founder of Fit Body Bootcamp. And one of the things that came across my social feed that I found was really fascinating. Well, two things. The first thing was that you were on Fox News a few times, which is great that you have that voice to be able to share your perspective from a boutique fitness um, owner. Because I think when people think about gyms, they think about, you know, big box gyms and not the boutique guys. And they're, they should be probably treated differently. And I, I assume you agree. But I wanted to um, dive into something you said, that you are going to open your locations on June 1st. So tell me more about that. Because according to what I've read, studied, whatever, in the state of California, at least, um, we are uneligible to open until phase three, which is not probably going to be June 1st. So let's start there, man. And, yeah. and thanks for taking the time to talk to me. Absolutely. And by the way, I'm a big fan of yours as well. And so it's great that we got to connect and have coffee a couple months ago before this whole thing went down. Um, Cause now we're connecting via zoom, but dude. Um, so, so I should, I should say this, that one, I'm absolutely on board with you. Like big box gyms and boutique gyms, very different. Like the reality is, and if anyone watching this, they can go to fitbodybootcamp.com and, and, and click on the letter from the CEO. And in that letter, there's a link to our 25 page fit body reopening protocol that any boutique gym can use. And it doesn't matter if they run a kind of a cross training type facility or boot camp or any kind of group training program. We completely outlined the system where you can sanitize people outside, including the bottoms of their shoes, bring them into eight by eight squares that are taped off. Their equipment is in there. So there is no rotation. There is no cross contamination of equipment. Everybody, we call it the train in place uh, modalities. And so like you could do that in a boutique gym like yours and mine. A big box gym like LA Fitness, Equinox, 24-Hour Fitness, people go in there and they're going to do bench press and then their flies and then they're going to go to dips and whatever. And then the next guy or gal is going to come and touch that. And no matter how much you wipe it off, there is still a likelihood of cross-contamination. So when you look at all the boutique gyms like us, whether personal training studios, cross-training gyms, boot camps, we must be differentiated from the big box gym, number one. Number two... The reason I decided to kind of plant my flag and say we are going back into business on June 1st is I did my research first because I realized, like I was telling you before we started recording, uh, you and I have got a social responsibility. Anyone that's got a following in an industry has a social responsibility and you can't be careless about it and go, hey, I think we should all buy guns and kill people or I think we should all right. whatever, right? Drink. Right. And for the record, I'm pro-gun, so I don't want people sending me messages talking about Second Amendment. I'm all about the Second Amendment. Um, I just use that as an example. And, and so I did the research, and I figured out one thing, Jason, and it's this, that already states like Utah and Georgia and Colorado opened up, and they ran like Fit Body Boot Camp locations as well as other boutique gyms. They ran their facilities, and the COVID virus didn't spike up. So the precautions they took worked. So one, there's already proof that being cautious and taking precautions helps, number one. Number two, as I looked at all the states that are about to open and all the states that, that said, hey, we're not going to open gyms until phase three and phase four, which is like mid to late summer. Right. I'm like, holy cow, why do these things line up with Democrat and Republican? Check this out. All but one state. See, I'm the kind of guy, I'm a little paranoid, so I do research first before I open my big trap and tell everybody on Fox News and CNN and social media that I'm opening up all fit body locations across Canada and US. That's like 700 some odd locations. Like that's a big bite of an apple. Um, and so I did my research. I'm like, all but one state are Democratic that said we're not going to open up. All the states that have opened up, gyms, uh, studio, personal training studios, uh, tanning salons, are Republican-leaning. Now, I'm a free market capitalist. I'm a libertarian, and I'm all about let's run the country by the Constitution. I don't like Democrats. I don't like Republicans because they both are agenda-driven, and they put the people last, period. I also moved to the United States from a communist country, and we escaped communism, which is currently what's happening here, for the fact that we want freedom and we want to be able to run a business. And so I know, I, I understand why my dad brought us here and risked his life. And so to me, I have a bigger responsibility than just, so when I look and I see, wait, there's some kind of political stuff being played. And as I was telling you before we started recording, if this was a true panicky pandemic with real death rates that, were mass, that weren't exaggerated, which I believe they are, 
then the president would never say, hey, look, every Democrat or every uh, governor, why don't you guys decide how you're going to run your state? The president would be like, look, we're putting military on the streets. Everybody stay inside. Here's the only people that can go outside and get their groceries, period, end of story. That's it. We're arresting you. And I would be the first person to be like, holy hell, guys, stay inside. Do not come out unless you need food and water, right? But the reality is when the buck is passed down to governors, that tells me this isn't that big a deal. Otherwise, the actual leader of our country would do something about it. Number two, why are we going into grocery stores and touching apples and oranges and bananas and gallons of milk and then putting them back and the next guy touches it, et cetera? If this was a real thing that could spread, why aren't we driving up and someone in a hazmat suit showing up and saying, here's your apples and oranges, Jason? Right. Right. So those two things, plus the fact that the states that are closed and the states that are open are leaning Democratic and Republican, tells me that there's a political agenda in a voting year in a, in a voting year, and their political agenda trumps the people's desire to work. And that is where I draw the line. So, okay, so, uh, all right. Before we talk about the liability, because I, I, I gotta get there. Yeah. I wanna talk about protocols. So you have this 25 page um, Fit Body Bootcamp. I looked at it. One of the pieces that I thought was interesting, so one of the reasons why for us at NC Fit, we haven't purchased any um, misters or, uh, you know, uh, cleaning supplies even for that matter is that we don't know what the government's gonna mandate as acceptable or not. Now the CDC put out something about the bleach and the water, I get that, right? So, so in the state of California at least, I haven't been told you have to use this, this, this protocol. So what does that do for you? And I'm curious, when you're making up your 25 page, what if the protocol's like, you have to wear a mask? Well, okay, let me go buy a bunch of masks. The problem is, what if they have to be N95 masks? Well, regardless of if you should be working out with N95 masks or not, that's a different conversation. If you went out and bought a thousand cloth masks for your members, but now they require N95, are you just out money? So what what criteria are you going off of to determine your 25 page plan? And then secondly, I wanna dive into cleaning the shoes because you're the first person I've seen that's talked about that. Touchless stuff, Purell, I get it. Like that's pretty standard. Even the misters, I get it. Cleaning between classes, I get it. But let's talk about the shoes and then talk about where you actually came up with those protocols for in your mind and why they're uh, bleach and not uh, Clorox wipes. Sure, sure. So I'm really glad you asked that too. And all gym owners should know where this is all coming from. Um, so first of all, we sent the 25-page protocol to the Center of Disease Control uh, COVID-19 Virus Task Force. We sent it to the White House and we sent it to Governor Newsom's office because we're obviously a California-based corporation, although we have franchise locations throughout Canada and U.S. Um, we sent it to them not to get their approval, but hey, here's a review. If you have any feedback, please give it to us. No one said anything. But the reason I came up with the 25-page protocol is because all these states were saying, hey, uh, like Atlanta and Colorado, uh, Alaska, Utah, we're saying, all right, gyms can open and they have to use social distancing and sanitization process. But no one, not the CDC, not the World Health Organization was coming out with the protocol, which by the way, again, told me that maybe this is not so serious if you're not giving us a protocol. Right, right, because right? you see what I'm saying, right? Is that you can say, oh, you need social distancing. But like, well, you gotta tell me what you want. Just keeping right. it clean doesn't, doesn't what, what does that mean? Keeping it clean to you might be totally different than it is for me. Exactly. So I decided that we're going to go overboard in keeping it clean because I'd rather err on the side of caution and keep our businesses open and serving our clients and communities. Because again, we have a social responsibility. I told every Fit Body owner, I'm like, look, guys, you're mandated to follow this 25 page protocol. I'm going all over the news saying this is what every Fit Body follows. If news van shows up at your studio and sees that you are not spraying down the bottoms of shoes with bleach and, and, and water dilution, that's your fault, not mine. You know, like I want them to know. Now, there's no CDC thing saying that you need to do that. I wanted to go above and beyond. I wanted to go beyond what they would expect so that there's never a doubt that, hey, Bedros, who says that he's opening up all his locations June 1st, and I'm encouraging every brand, your brand, Orange Theory, F45, I, I, I said in all my posts and all my um, uh, newscasts that if you are a privately owned gym, a personal training studio, a group training program or franchise, jump on board with our movement, but follow our protocol. Here it is. I'm giving it to everyone. And it, the protocol also even has a waiver in it that your clients could sign that, God forbid, someone might come in here with, with uh, the COVID-19 virus and I might get it, right? So we took care of, like, I, I spent 
thousands of dollars with my attorneys and I'm giving that protocol away. But I'm doing that because no one's giving it to us, Jason. No one's giving it to us. So I wanted to overextend myself and do that so that no one can point to any fitness center, not just the Fit Body Bootcamp. They can't point to yours, mine, or anyone else's and say it was because of them and the way they ran it that the virus spread again. And so hopefully it won't spread. We've seen this with four states already that they were able to open and keep it running. Now, why did we choose also spray down the bottoms of their shoes? Simple. We do the 100 ounces of water to one ounce of bleach mixture that the CDC recommends because shoes typically bring 80% of germs, bacteria, and viruses into a gym environment, especially in an environment like ours, yours and mine, boutique facilities where people might be doing uh, battle ropes or kettlebell swings, but the next minute they're doing planks and burpees where their hands are touching the ground. And so the alternative was, do we have them bring a second pair of shoes? Well, we don't know where those shoes have been. Do we have them bring their just, hey, work out barefoot or in socks? Well, we don't know where your feet have been, and we certainly aren't going to spray down the bottoms of your feet. So we went with, all right, we're going to have them spray down the bottoms of their shoes and in the eight by eight train in place um, box that they're they're given on the ground, they need to bring a beach towel so they can put all their, their sweat goes on the towel and their sweat goes home with them and doesn't just stay on the mats. Of course, then we sanitize the entire facility and then run the next class. Yeah, I think the shoe thing's really interesting to me. I, I, the reason why, and I wanna know more about the rest of the protocol, but the shoe thing's interesting. So we have locations in Asia and in Asia, um, the culturally, you take your shoes off at the front door, right? It's just kind of like a cultural thing. Yeah. In the United States, not as much. But um, in Asia, they have um, many of the gyms, specifically at our corporate partners, you have two different pairs of shoes. You have your pair of shoes that are outside the gym. You have your pair of shoes that are inside the gym. Very interesting the way that culturally it is, right, where they have a separate pair of shoes. Um, now, this is also at a corporate environment, so it might be a little bit different, but it just goes to show that, especially in the Asian cultures, everybody that I've seen takes their shoes off at the front door and they go into the house. Now, when my daughter got sick with leukemia, one of the big things that we had, we had Purell, like we had Purell basically baths before you came in, right? right? But one of the other things that we did when people came into the hospital room or um, came to our house, we'd ask them to take their shoes off um, and we'd really make, do a good job of clean, clean the floors. Cause you know, what you said just seems like common sense. Like you're outside doing whatever you're doing, right? Then you go from doing that to, let's just say you're doing to your point, battle ropes, to burpees, to whatever, I totally, I totally understand your perspective. What other pieces do you have in that protocol besides the, um, so I know you have the, the shoe concept, you have touchless concept. Um, yeah. and, and what other like unique characteristics do you think um, are, are you bringing to the table um, besides obviously social distancing, et cetera? Yeah, yeah. So, so one of the things we did, like probably just like your gyms, Fit Body Boot Camps, all have like a lobby kind of a waiting area where the next session, we call it session, you might call it class, but the next session or class waits while this class is going. Now we've actually outlined an area, a holding stall, if you will, outside in the parking lot or on the sidewalk, six feet apart, where people can wait outside. The door's not even, uh, the door is closed by the coach and open by the coach only. The door is then opened, everybody leaves. And then the next group sanitizes while they're outside. They sanitize. We spray the bottoms of their feet. They wipe the bottoms of their feet on a thick uh, pad, and then they walk in. And so there's never people even, because you look at a doorway, it's three and a half feet wide. If people pass through, you just broke the social distancing rule. And that's what's happening, by the way, at grocery stores all day long. Of and they're like, hey, six feet apart, but you go into an aisle, there's no way you could be six feet apart, and you're just bumping into each other. And so I decided we're going to go above and beyond so that if any news van comes to any Fit Body Boot Camp or any gym that's running the Fit Body Reopening Protocol, there's no way that clients, if you're running it right, there's no way clients are ever coming in contact, talking to each other. Um, and if they are, they're talking to each other from afar. Uh, there's no high-fiving. So we've got this thing at the end of every workout. We bring it in and break it down where everyone puts their hands together and then we break it down. I'm like, guys, we're not doing that right now. Everyone's working out in the eight by eight, one spot with two pieces of equipment and that's it that's what you work out with and your body weight the equipment sanitized right after the workout and so we've created that product protocol plus a release right like i said every uh, coach has to sign a release that i do realize that i'm running this workout in a facility that might have covid19 or a client might have one the coaches will have masks on because they're going to be yelling screaming 
and okay. there's absolutely a chance of your coaches, you know, throwing droplets. Right, 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 right. And, and so I got, I got to ask you. So, okay. And now let's. Now that there's some nit and gritty questions, I'm really curious about with you. Yeah. And there's really three. Number one, let's start here. Risk and liability. Okay. So, we, if someone comes into our gym right now, and uh, or someone comes into your gym June first, and you you have your current insurance rider and your current insurance policy, your umbrella policy, you name it. But if you're not legally allowed to open, regardless of if big box gyms and small gyms should be, cons I mean, I'm in agreement with you on everything, right? They, they should be different criteria. But the fact of the matter is, as of right now, we are all landing in the same boat, right? So if you do open and something happens, what happens if your insurance won't cover you? And it likely won't. And that, that's the scary thing. It like, it, look, it likely won't. <laughs> I love it, man. No, but, I love it because you're not beating around the bush, right? Yeah. And, but... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you this, and I know we're on the same page, but let's just pontificate for a moment. I'm going to ask sure. you this. What happens if you don't open and this shelter in place goes on for another three months and just like they promised they'd get us the financial relief, but then delayed it. In fact, 80,000 80, people got their financial relief check. 70, uh, not 80,000, 80 million Americans got yeah. it. 70 millions have not gotten it yet. Uh, and so what, ha like the government, remember, uh, let me ask you a question. Jason, are you in business for a profit or just to break even? <laughs> Oh, come on. A profit, of course. Profit, right? So is everybody yeah. watching and listening to this. Well, the government didn't say, hey, Bedros, I'm going to send you a PPP check the size of your last month's profit. They just said enough to stay afloat. I'm not in fucking business to stay afloat. I'm in business to make a profit. I got to donate to Shriners Children's Hospital, Toys for Tots, Compassion International. I donate seven figures every year. And Jason, I can't donate that money if they're just giving me enough to break even. And how do they know what break even is? Because they don't know if my landlord is going to start my rent back up. They only gave me two months of rent on this $17,000 a month building. That was it. I only got a two month break. And so my rent kicked up again. Well, I haven't gotten anything yet. By the way, there you go. There you go. Yeah. Right. And, and so when I say that, it's, it's not the alternative is what I'd rather be able to go back to business, make money. And God forbid someone, something happens to someone, the insurance isn't going to pay. I'll take that risk over the risk of losing my business and going broke and then going, oh, well, I guess the government couldn't keep up. Sorry. That's so I, I really appreciate what you just said, because you're to your point, you're manning up to um to what to what's to what you're, you're talking about because you you understand there's and I, I say this to everybody every owner needs to weigh out their risk and lie their, their risk right hey what is your appetite here like if you're gonna go out of business either way you might as well go this path or maybe you have a strong cash flow you have a digital product whatever maybe you go this way so i appreciate what you just said because um i think everybody needs to take that into their own consideration and be a be a owner about it and make their decision but knowing knowing the risk on both sides right yeah um, and, and to that point i told every fit body owner i said i'm encouraging all of you to open up but i'm also not going to pay your fines your citations your whatever because part of this is for us to make a stand and if you're not willing to do that i love you i respect you and i'm okay with it stay shut and that's okay too wait for your state to give you the green light but just know that might take a while sure uh, agreed um the second thing i want to ask you about is the vibe Right. And this is, I'm, I'm super curious about this because look, waiting outside, coming in, actually, this is a two part question. Number one is the vibe of having a coach with a mask on, right? Being super, super sterile environment where you used to go in and, you know, chest bumps, high fives, whatever. Now all of a sudden you're coming in and, and the equation I've made, and, and I'm sure you, you know, you used to go to fine dining. So did I, what, you know, if you went back into your favorite restaurant, but there's half as many people, the waiters are wearing masks and the vibe is off. Would you rather just do takeout or would you, or would you, if you're a few bad experiences away at that restaurant from maybe never coming back. So my question for you is twofold, or actually it's, it's all one. If, if someone comes in and they have a vibe that's kind of like a little sterile, not what they are used to, are you afraid they're gonna come in one, two, three times and then be like, dude, you know what, man? Bedros, this isn't the same Fit Body Bootcamp I was used to. I'm just going to go ahead and put my membership or whereas if you waited another month for public perception regulations to change whatever would you be in a better position I, I'm, I'm curious yeah well again I, I think I have a unique I have a unique perspective that most people don't because as a franchise we get to see all the numbers right from every location across two countries 
And so what we found was after week number three of quarantine, every week that went by, there was a 3% increase in cancellations and, and, and uh, freezes. Fair enough. So start doing the math. How many 3% is it going to take before you're completely canceled and froze everybody and you're done? And no one's doing online coaching and any of that stuff. Right now, the average location is around 33 to 36% of less revenue, making less revenue. And if this continues on again, it's going to get to obviously 60, 70%, and then it's over. And so at some point, you have to be willing to take that risk. And now what we've done, make no mistake about it, we've already started to prep our clients by saying, hey guys, it's going to be a new normal for a temporary period of time. We're guessing that somewhere between four to six weeks, if we don't see the virus spiking in our facility, in our community, then we're going to loosen up and go back to a normal facility. But until then, please be aware, we'll have music, but we won't have high fives. Some of us will have masks on, some of us won't. We won't be doing the four station rotation like we normally do, we'll be training in place. So when you set the expectations for your clients, like anything else, you know, I coach a lot of businesses and entrepreneurs and whatever. And I set the expectation, look, we're going to meet twice in a year in person. And then we do 12 monthly phone coaching calls. This way they know we're not going to meet every month. You're not going to blow my phone up every time you get this whim of an idea because I would need to charge you a million dollars and not just $50,000 for the year of coaching, right? So setting expectations for my coaching clients keeps them on track. Setting expectations for our clients and gyms keeps them on track as well. Where okay, I'm going to come into FitBody. There's a new process. So we even wrote the emails for them. I don't, the only thing we left out of those, that 25 page protocol for our fit body owners, it's actually 29 pages because we said, here's the two emails uh, you're going to send out to your clients to kind of set the narrative of what to expect, how long to expect that for, why we're doing right. it. So the expectations are set, but yeah, there is definitely a concern, Jason of like, Oh shit. What if they come three, four, five times, like the restaurant example you gave and they're like, you know, it's probably better to just do takeout. Uh, but we got to do something because no one's doing it for us, man. And, and, and so, yeah, and this is, by the way, I, I love this type of conversation because it's really interesting to, to see the, the, the way you think about it, right? Um, and so on that same note, my, my final piece to this is the financial side. So look, we're seeing a 3% drops and this and that. And I appreciate your numbers because I talk to a lot of gym owners and we have a lot that are part of our network. And you talk to some people in the CrossFit space in particular, and there's people that are saying, hey, our membership is still strong, it's still strong. And I think one of the reasons is that, you know, most of these guys have 100 members. They, they're Zoom calling with them on a regular basis. And those members really feel like, hey, the $100 I'm giving you or whatever is going directly to pay your bills. And so you have good, um, kind of like this goodwill from the members. Sure. If you, but once your membership base passes two, 300 people or whatever it is, it, it kind of changes the dynamic a little bit. And so I understand why you, you've seen the numbers and, and same with us, right? We've seen the same thing. Now I want to talk about um, from a revenue perspective, your, your previous fit body bootcamp classes, let's just say average uh, 15 to 20 people. Let's just say, right. Or what, what did they average? 30 to 35, 30 to 35. Okay, great. Right now the average is going to have to average what 10 to 15, 15 if we're lucky. Right. So from a financial perspective, my question for you, and this is, I'm asking the same thing for us, by the way, yeah. is we're going back to our landlords. We're looking to readjust the, the rent because I mean, we spend a lot of money on rent. And at some point we, we sign that lease predicated on, oh, this amount of people, this many square feet, this many hours, whatever, just like you guys do. So if you're dividing your, 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 your membership in half, how are you going to accommodate if you were at capacity? And then, if, and then secondly, if you have 15 people classes at 30, how do you pay the bills and create profitability? Good question. So we, what we did on March 17th is when we pivoted to online coaching, we started to do, we used Trainerize, Zoom, and private Facebook groups to do live follow along workouts early in the morning. And then that workout that was recorded, we share on Facebook group all day long for people who want to follow along. And we do two lives, like every franchise owner, every facility does a live uh, Q and a twice a day in their group to kind of keep their clients engaged. And so we immediately launched a program after that called the 28 day stronger together challenge, which is $28, 28 days for 28 bucks for, of online coaching. And then if you like it, stay on board with us at $97 a month until we, our gym reopens. And so thankfully we've been able to sell the bejesus out of that. So the loss that we're experiencing from the facilities at 3% a week, we're gaining some of that through this 28 day stronger together challenge. 
So that's one place we're gaining the revenue. But for the individual do, gym or for corporate? For the individual gym. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So everything we do at corporate, we do it for our franchisees, right? Got it. And as long as they're paying our franchise fees, we're good here at corporate. And so we're serving them. Yeah. And so what we told our owners were, look, look, when you open your facility and you've got eight by eight taped off and you're maybe training 10 to 12 people at a time, there's no way you're going to be able to get to all your clients. So you're probably going to need to tell them, hey, you're going to be twice a week in facility, twice a week online doing a hybrid. So we're going from all online to hybrid to then eventually offline once people feel comfortable and we can take the tape off and bring more bodies in. And I said, where your profit margins are concerned, your profit margins are going to take a dip because the extra cleaning solution, the extra clean time in labor, right? And then the lack of bodies in there per session or class are actually gonna eat away at profits. But we have to take that step back in order to be able to take the steps forward and ultimately opening up. And so part of it is almost like, you know, when you take your kid to the doctor, you're like, honey, you're gonna get your, uh, they're gonna put a needle, they're gonna give you a shot. It's the vaccine that you need because you're four years old. It's right. gonna hurt, but then you're never- suck. Yeah, but yeah. you're not going to have the chicken pox, right? Right, right, right. And so you got to take a little bit of that pain. And so I've always found that when I'm open, honest in my communication with my franchisees, and I talk to them three times a week via Facebook Live in a private Facebook group, Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 12 noon. Um, look, man, they were scared. They were uncertain. There was some doubt. There was even some pushback. But I was like, guys, we're just going to listen to you. We're going to do this together. And we were able to pull it off. So all of them agree that, yeah, I am willing to take a little bit of a financial hit when I open my doors and do the train in place protocol. Um, but it's the only way I'll be able to transition back to how business was. So we almost have to cross that bridge in order to get there. Yeah, I, I love, no, and, and dude, it's, it's very refreshing for me because I mean, obviously the things that I'm speaking to you about, I've been thinking the exact same way. We, we're in the Bay Area, we have very, very expensive rents. And um, we can't assume. And, and one of the things that I'm worried about, and I mean, it sounds like you, you have your protocols in place. One of the challenges that I'm running into with the boutique fitness space is that some of these guys that are rushing to reopen, I don't know if they fully understand the cost of cleaning the, and some of your negotiating power with your, with your landlord right. um, might go away. Right. So for us, you know, we haven't gone, we're, we're negotiating with our landlords to say, Hey, when we reopen, if you reopen, you might lose the opportunity to negotiate, right? So you have to do that before you reopen. So what, Right. And can I actually share our strategy? No, hell yeah. Dude, that's what I want to talk about. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> so so that, that is one of the beauties that we have here as a, as a franchise, but I'll be more than happy to share it with anyone watching this as well. Before you reopen, so we always tell our Fit Body owners, which is why I told them June 1st and not like, hey, tomorrow, right? And here we are, today is June, uh, sorry, today is May 15th or something? 15th, so they have two weeks. I said, guys, you're going to go tell them that, hey, if I continue to stay shut, um, I, may never have to, I may never reopen, and I may have to shut down and never pay you rent again. So we've decided as a franchise to open up June 1st, but because of my higher cleaning cost, payroll, and a much smaller number of clientele per class, I'm going to make less money. So Mr. Landlord, when I open up, I need you to charge me less per rent. How about half? And so we're teaching them how to negotiate. We crafted a letter for them to give to their landlords so that they can have that dialogue ahead of time. Because the last thing we need is for the landlord to go, well, now you got to pay full rent while you have less clients and higher expenses. That's, that's, a, that's the kiss of death. Yeah, exactly. So what we, the recommendation we've been providing is, hey, have your P&L ready be able to explain to them, hey, look at this, look at this decrease in rep, like actually have like quantifiable, any landlords to be able to look at it, dude, you're a service-based business, you can't service as many people, your revenue potential has gone down, like it's, it's black and white, right, I mean, exactly. restaurants and gyms are going to be in the exact same situation, um, airlines are going to be in a really unique situation as well, and so moving forward, um, it, you're, you're negotiating your landlords, you're reopening, you're trying to get this kind of like 50, 50 model. We're in the gym, outside the gym. Um, what would you say to business owners? Uh, you know, fit bodies a brick and mortar. Uh, what would you say to a gym owner who wants to be brick and mortar, but then completely pivot to only like how much digital is too much. And then all of a sudden you, you're so focused over here that once your brick and mortar reopens, now you're one foot in one foot out, or even worse, you've been an operator for a decade brick and mortar. And then all of a sudden you became a digital operator because of necessity. But now if you shift here too far, 
you may be fit, you know, one foot in, one foot out on both of the things, and you have no expertise in this digital area compared to where we were in brick and mortar, and vice versa. If you're a digital business, it's hard to go back here. So how do people balance that? Because I'm sure you've seen this. When we've tried to incorporate personal training, it's challenging because our trainers aren't as, it, it's not built into the business model as much. They're more of a group style training. So what does that look like for you? Yeah, so that, that's a really good question. And so one thing we did when this whole kind of shelter in place thing started and we weren't able to train clients in facility was I said, guys, we're going all in on, on online coaching. Like we have to, we're gonna drink from the fire hydrant and thankfully I've got gr great access. Many of my coaching clients are guys like Devin Physique and Tony Steffen who've got thousands of online coaching clients. And so I reached out to them. I'm like, hey, what is the best modalities that you're using? Wes Watson, for example. And so we just went to the best who are doing online coaching and then we created our own online coaching platform because of it. We used the last eight weeks to become experts at it and not only servicing our clients, but also marketing and selling it. Because as you know, selling face-to-face -face gym memberships or you know, group training, personal training is different than over the phone or online. So we had to teach our franchisees that as well. And I said, guys, get really good at it because when the doors open, we're now gonna keep that as a secondary income stream for you. And so we are keeping it as a secondary income stream. I would highly encourage every other gym to do that as well because we will have more situations like this where two flu seasons from now, which could be in 2022, another COVID type thing happens. See, once, once you've gone down that road of shutting down businesses, now it's going to be a thing. Just like once the airplanes hit the World Trade Centers, people were trying to light their fucking shoes on fire to blow up an airplane. They were trying to take baby formula that was like nitroglycerin. Like now crazy type of terrorist attacks took place. And so now the very extreme uh, correlation, yeah. but uh, yeah. But it's true. It, it, yeah. It's true. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I am a, an extreme person, by the way. So as if you didn't know, but yeah. So um, th that said, I told all of our owners, we may have to shut down our doors again, so you're going to have to pivot back to online coaching, but create that as a secondary income stream. And then with all business, it's about the three Ps, the people, the product, and the processes. So we've got great people running Fit Body Bootcamp gyms, and I'm sure you have with your gyms. The product has to be solid, like they have to deliver a product that people want to be evangelical about and talk about and tell their friends about. And then you have to have a process. And so we said, all right. Now that we have, we have facility leaders, we have front desk reps, we have accountability coaches, like we have all these different roles in a fit body, we now have our online coaches. And so we created the online coaching platform. We have online coaches. That one coach's responsibility is to run the online platform piece because if you have a client, the spouse loses their job, now they say, hey, I can't afford to pay $180 a month. Great, can you pay 77 a month and do the online version? Yes, I can. Now we have a downsell. And so we created that thing and it's going to stick for us. And I would highly recommend that every gym owner creates online coaching as a secondary income stream moving forward. Yeah. Yep. It's a, you know, it's, you're seeing it with restaurants, the restaurants that already had an app or, or already had some type of digital takeout model. They've been able to pivot a lot quicker yeah. than those that were just really stuck in the old school. And so that's really interesting. And so moving forward, you have your six open, uh, six one uh, opening date. Um, you've already discussed a variety of things that were really interesting when it comes to, um, government support, I just want to shift here for just a minute and then we'll kind of, you know, finish up with the PPP. How many of your franchisees have been able to see support? Most of them who applied for it, got it, uh, about a third of them got it on the second round, which was about two weeks ago when they, uh, when, when uh, president Trump signed that deal. Um, we here at headquarters got it because I had, I had committed to not firing anyone. And so we here at headquarters got it. Um, so thankfully that came through, came through a little late and it wasn't quite what they said for, for many locations. Uh, probably same for you. I'm sure. Yeah. Well, that's what I want to talk about. So, um, our PPP did come through on the second round, right? Yeah. Um, but you know, I've been very cautious with gym owners. Like, it's not like all rainbows and unicorns. It's, it's, it's actually fairly complex. And you need to look at it as a 1% loan for two years that needs to be proven to be forgiven and not a forgiven 100,000, 200,000 million, whatever it is. And then, you know, uh, you, it, it, it's a loan that needs to be proven forgiven. And it's very complex. I mean, would you agree? And, and what is the strategy there? Yeah, it is very complex, and I believe it is worth taking the time to understand it. Now, again, 
uh, depending on the size of the business, it's easy enough for me to walk into our accounting department where we have three accountants and go, hey, right. one of you become an expert at what we need to do to not have to pay a 1% interest on a penny of this, right? Right, right. And we were figuring it out and they're, they're literally combing. But how does a single gym owner do that? Well, what, it's, it's near impossible. And I, so I think it's by design. But thankfully, if you just look at it as a 1% interest loan, and let's say 20% of it, you don't have to pay back 80% you do. And that 80%, you're paying 1% interest. That's a pretty effing good loan. It's like, a great you loan. To grow your business. Don't go building a pool in the backyard. Like market smart, follow up aggressively, sell people, deliver such amazing results that they want to become evangelical and ask them for more referrals. And then now you took someone else's money, right? Um, OPM, other people's money government's money, which is ultimately your money, your tax dollars, and you use it as a 1% loan to grow and scale your business. That's how we need to look at it. Yeah. So I, I'm in agreement with you. I, it's good to hear that, you, you know, I, so for us, we have accounting, finance guys that are working on it. But for the, you know, I, I told our guy, I said, man, this is very complex. He goes, yeah, but keep in mind, if you're a single gym owner operator, you probably didn't have as many complexities in your business model, didn't maybe receive as much funding, and it might be a little bit cleaner because you have 25% towards uh, you know, um, uh, rent, and then you have the 75% towards uh, the payroll. Uh, but, but it is interesting to, for you to hear that it's also just as complex, and I think a lot of owners need to remind themselves that it's not all, you know, it, it's a 1% loan for two years that needs to be proven otherwise. And I think if you do it the way you're saying, using other people's money, I mean, tax dollars is kind of a gray area, but point being is that if you use that other people's money for 1% interest to go build your business, instead of going to put your pool in, that's great advice for people. Cause right now coming out of this to finish off this conversation, where do you see the opportunities at? Because I'm seeing it. And as an entrepreneurial guy, never in our lifetime, I hope, and I doubt will this ever happen again? Meaning this extreme, this, I mean, uh, we've never really seen it for many years and we probably won't ever see it again. So what type of opportunities do you think will come out for those uh, seeking them in the fitness space and, and outside? You know, that's a really good question because it's so easy to kind of dwell on like, man, how do we figure out the PPP and how do we figure this stuff out? And like the complexities and the uncertainties, but look at all the benefits, the value that we get from this, right? Huge. So one, if you are a really good, like let's think 2008, Remember when uh, everybody was like in 2006, seven, uh, 2005, six and seven, everybody that I knew was a real estate agent because home prices were just, people were buying home with like tw paying 20% more than the value, et cetera. But then when 2008, the housing market crashed, all these people, the would be real estate agents went away, went back to selling cars and doing mortgage and whatever. And the real agents stuck around. So there's going to be a thinning of the herd. If you're a great gym owner, you deliver results, you have amazing culture, you have you have a team that really cares and loves and you, your gym is like cheers where it's like the second home that people want to come to. Yeah. You survive this time. You're going to find that your competitors are out of business and you're going to be able to take their clients. Number one. So one, you're gaining other people's clients and you're gaining less competition. So the cost of marketing should be lower as well. Number three on top of that is that your landlord now is willing to strike up a deal if you're going to renew your lease or move across the street or get a bigger facility or if you want some TI, tenant improvement. Like we already have landlords willing to upgrade the building saying, hey, don't leave. Just stay around. We'll give you better rent and we'll do some upgrades to the building for when your clients come back. It'll be a nicer looking gym. Like landlords want the place filled. So there's a lot of benefits. But again, we have to cross that bridge. So everybody needs to practice emotional resilience, mental toughness, be willing to cross the scary bridge to get to the other side where we will have more clients, lower cost of marketing, and lower facility costs, rent and build out because now the tables have turned and there are more buildings available than people who want to take them. I agree. One of the things I also think is going to sniff out is, is not just owners, but also coaches. The yeah. good coaches are going to thrive. If you're a shitty coach, you probably can't do it online. It's very difficult to be a very good coach online. I mean, excuse me, it's more difficult to be a good coach online than it is in person. In person, sometimes people just, all right, guys, work out and just put on the music, right? And just kind of walk around, arms crossed. Online, you got to be engaged, flowing. And so I think that the good coaches are going to thrive through that. And the bad coaches will kind of exit and go find something else to pursue. Agreed. Um, it really is a great opportunity. It's just sometimes the best opportunities first have to, it's like the cheese. 
uh, it's the medicine wrapped in cheese. You, you got to take the medicine and you're going to have to eat, you're going to eat the cheese because it tastes good, but it's going to have to be some medicine first. And so <laughs> we, we have to take the medicine to get to the cheese. I've never heard the cheese analogy, uh, maybe pudding or something, but all right. Um, so Bedros, uh, any owner out there who's looking for your 25 uh, page protocol, um, anybody who wants to know a little bit more about you who wasn't familiar with who you were and um, Fit Body Bootcamp, where can they find you? Uh, what's the best place to go? Yeah, good place. So uh, if anyone wants to go and get the protocol, they're more than welcome to use it. Just don't, don't knock it off and, and take credit for it. If you're going to give credit, give credit where credit's due. Fitbodybootcamp.com. You'll find, there, you'll find it there. Um, and then if you want to learn more about me and follow me, just follow me on Instagram at Bedros Koulian. All right. And we'll, uh, we'll show those. Um, we'll put those notes in, the, um, in the, the podcast as well. Well, thank you so much for being with us on the Business of Fitness. And uh, I'll chat with you soon, brother. Thank you, Jason. Appreciate it, man.